that Ruth is going to present then the speaker for today's uh, ground rounds. Ruth? I'd love to. So again, I'd love to um, I welcome back Dr. Hudson Garrett. Um, Dr. Garrett has a wealth of experience and, and not only working in the field of infection prevention and control, but the regulatory side that looks at medical devices and all of the challenges that uh, that we are faced with when we are using a medical device that is not disposable, uh, something that we are, are reusing. This is a topic that is particularly timely, and I'm so glad that he's able to discuss this because as many of you are aware, not only are we having um, outbreaks associated with medical devices again, but we are also then having some um, recurrent conversations about how we should be approaching medical devices and um, and processing, reprocessing, and monitoring, tracing, and so forth. And even then, what now, what is the new, kind of this post-COVID uh, time, what is the new uh, place where we are landing when we look at the use of disposable versus reusable, and what should be some of our thought processes? So I'm delighted that Dr. Garrett is here just to kind of give us this high-level overview and what some of the considerations are that uh, we will all have to deal with if we are using anything in our settings that is reusable. So uh, Dr. Garrett, thank you for your time again today. Let me turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much for the invitation. Good to see so many familiar faces, uh, even though I have to sit here and look at Dave as well. So um, just a little joke. Uh, <laughs> Dave and I've worked together for a long, long time. Um, as Dr. Carrico mentioned, I'm extremely excited to talk about medical device safety, specifically as it relates to sort of the overall continuum of care. This is a, a topic area that I have unfortunately gotten a lot of experience in. Um, uh, through a sort of forced voluntold learning, if you will. Um, but really the objectives for today's uh, Grand Rounds are to look at some of the implications for these new FDA safety alerts, really where they came from, sort of the impetus behind them, almost like what we call pathophysiology um, in terms of that, but looking at it from a medical device standpoint. The second area we're gonna look at really detailed is, is sort of a, a budding issue around flexible endoscopes and the cross-contamination risk. And then lastly is how we can sort of operationalize some of these FDA best practices. Keep in mind, though, that the FDA is a regulatory agency, as Dr. Carrico just mentioned, and they don't have the power to regulate the practice of medicine. So they do have the power to regulate the actual product and the device, but they can't tell us how to practice within a health system. And so that leaves it a little bit open um, in terms of interpretation. So there's been a, a lot of different issues, um, specifically sort of starting in the gastroenterology space. And we'll talk about some of the, the other things that have, have come from this, but it really started in the GI space. And then they said, wait a minute, there's some other issues that we're seeing with these reusable medical devices, particularly those that are in that semi-critical category. Just as a reminder, just to make sure we're all in the same field here, um, the semi-critical devices are those that come in contact with mucous membranes, but not sterile body cavities. So a great example of this is the laryngoscope blade and handle um, that is gonna go inside the oral mucosa, uh, would require a minimum of high-level disinfection or preferably sterilization um, as it's reprocessing means. So lots of different news stories have come out starting about 10 years ago with different devices, right? And we don't ever really see issues with things like blood pressure cuffs or pulse oximeters, but yet we have moved into a disposable arena in most of those areas, right? But with the more complex devices where we have absolutely seen outbreaks, absolutely seen mortality and morbidity, we've been very slow to respond. Um, and so we're gonna focus in today heavily on scopes and some of the issues that FDA's found through multiple different modalities. That's what's kind of interesting is you would think that there's a lot more surveillance in this area that's taking place to protect the patient and frankly, to protect the healthcare institution, but in reality, there's not. And we've got a lot of room to grow here. So there's a couple of things that triggered these multiple FDA safety alerts. And I'm gonna give you sort of a, a historical timeline here in just a second. First and foremost is there were actual infections that were reported. <clears throat> So certainly when we see contamination of the device that's genetically tied back to the isolate found in the patient, we know that there's a match there. Um, and our technology is so good now that we're able to do that. Now, one of the challenges, especially with endoscopes that we find, is that you can't identify and, and sort of uh, recover some of these isolates very easily. It does require a specialized laboratory, an environmental laboratory, and in some cases, your public health authorities like the CDC in order to recover those bugs. <clears throat> 
The second piece is that there were a lot of issues um, identified with reprocessing instructions. We've just seen an example of this where there's a currently marketed product that has FDA clearance that is used quite you know, often across the United States that even if you follow the manufacturer's instructions, it still fails reprocessing, which means that device is not safe to be used in patients. <clears throat> excuse me, the third area is reprocessing methods in general are pretty flawed and they require us, right? When we're involved, as much as I love people, we know that when we're involved, there's inconsistency, there's variability, there's human factors challenges that are going to prevent us from being consistent in our approach to reprocessing every single time. And last but not least is the area that the FDA initially focused on solely, which was the endoscope's design in the, in the first place. Right now, medical devices are designed for really one of two purposes, to either help diagnose or to help treat. We call that diagnostic and therapeutic in the world of the regulatory scheme. But when we think about these devices in terms of the patients, the patients come to us for care and treatment and diagnosis. They don't come to us from a cross-contamination, right? They don't wanna have some type of preventable infection. So the FDA commissioned what they call a 522 study. Now, you probably have never heard of this term because it is very infrequently used by the FDA, but a 522 study is nothing more than a fancy term for saying you must do this. This is a regulatory requirement in order for you to stay on the market. And so they went after the three big manufacturers in the United States that had FDA cleared duodenoscopes that were used for ERCP procedures. This is where we found the majority of the initial outbreaks that were reported. Not only did we see outbreaks and deaths, but we also saw a lot of legal action around this particular category of medical devices. And so they focused on duodenoscopes first. They looked at two basic things. One is, can I reliably actually reprocess this instrument according to the manufacturer's instructions for use? So let's say that I take Dave and Dr. Carrico and Dr. Ramirez, and I put them all in a room. And I say, guys, we're going to train you for the next eight hours on how to reprocess this flexible endoscope. At the end of the day, if they're trained the same way, they have the same training materials, they go through the exact same training process, can all three of them reliably and consistently perform the task at the end of the training? Now, as much as I love Dave and I love Dr. Carrico and Dr. Ramirez, that's not gonna happen, right? Because all three of them are unique individuals and they may take their own shortcuts or they may miss a step here or there. And the average amount of steps that's required to reprocess these reusable medical devices is anywhere between 100 and 300 steps. So you're talking about a manual that may be upwards of 250 pages. There's no way that even the most qualified central sterile processing personnel can manage this process. The second area that they looked at, which was quite fascinating was, if I actually do this reprocessing and I do it according to the manufacturer's instructions for use, Will the devices have viable pathogens that will cause human infection still on them? Now, as you can imagine, the FDA said, of course not. They, that would never happen. That would never happen. We'll never have anything that would cause human infection because these devices should essentially be sterile. Well, that is not at all what we would find. And that's not all what we expect to find because these are not treated as sterile devices. So these findings then had a ripple effect to other reusable medical devices used in the pulmonology space, urology, ear, nose, and throat, and many others. And of course, with COVID, we know that the bronchoscopy space became one of our riskiest areas of healthcare due to the potential for aerosol generating procedures. So FDA said, we've got two buckets, right? We've got a bucket, what we call high concern organisms. And then we have a bucket of what we call low or moderate concern. Let's do the easy one first, high concern. These are the ones that are likely to cause human infection and disease. Something like CRE, that's gonna be carbapenem resistant. Um, maybe you've got a, a multi-drug resistant form of acetinobacter, um, those types of things. And, and, and the FDA's expectation was zero. We don't wanna see any of these. These devices should never have these in them if they're properly reprocessed. That was their expectation. And I'll show you the results here in a minute. And then the low and moderate concern were sort of a mixture of environmental contaminants and, and, and commensals. So things that we would find in the environment, but should not really find in a medical device. And let me give you an example of one that still just completely um, warps my brain. I remember looking at a culture result I actually did the first 522 study for the FDA um, with the device. And, and I looked at the results and I thought, I've never, ever even seen or heard of this organism before. So I called up a, a resident microbiology friend of mine. I said, have you ever heard of this? And he said, no, 
He said, but let me look it up. And he looks it up and it's actually pigeon poop, right? You heard me right. I said pigeon poop. And I said, how in the world is it possible that pigeon fecal material has entered a reprocessed medical device that is ready for patient use? So we went and did an outbreak investigation and we found that in the reprocessing room, it was one of those wonderfully designed reprocessing rooms where it was two sites, right? They had never redesigned it probably since 1970 and right down the middle of the room was a red line. And I said, well, what's, up, what's the red line for? And they said, well, the right side is the dirty side. The left side is the clean side. Now keep in mind that this room was so small that you could probably spin around with both arms out and touch the walls, right? So we're not talking about an ideally uh, designed climate here. The reason that they had pitch and fecal material was because they had a wall mounted AC unit in the middle of the summer uh, in a high rise older hospital in New York City, right? And so there was a hole underneath there that was bringing environmental contaminants in that was then contaminating the device, right? Again, the FDA's expectation was there'd be a minimal amount less than 100 colony forming units um, of these types of organisms. So here's the results, right? Almost 6%. And in some cases, you would see if you broke this out by device, you would see upwards of 10%. But sort of the averages here were about 5% for Olympus, 4.9% for Pentax, and 1.9% for Fuji. Now, keep in mind that the sample size for Fuji, as you can see, the N is much, much smaller, which is going to skew those statistics. But this was an alarming fact for the FDA to sit in here. Because again, their expectation was that none of these devices would have anything harmful in them. And so from that, they said, what in the world is happening here? We need to better understand what's taking place. And we realize that there's machines that reprocess different devices, whether it's an AER, we may do sterilization as an example. We may have some type of mechanical washing or ultrasonic scaling that may take place. We've got environmental contamination where we don't necessarily understand what is even on the device itself. What I mentioned earlier is that when you're culturing medical devices, it is not best practice. I repeat, it is not best practice to use your hospital lab. Your hospital laboratories are not typically set up to do this type of culture work. You really need to use an FDA certified environmental lab with expertise in medical device uh, safety and, and culturing. And I'll give you a perfect example. I worked on a, an outbreak associated with CRE with four different patients. One, two of those patients died. Um, the facility cultured it twice, couldn't recover anything, sent it to the State Department, uh, a public health laboratory. They cultured it, couldn't do anything. And I said, can I please send the device to CDC? And fortunately, I was able to get custody of the device, send it to CDC overnight, and they were able to recover the organism, right? Because there are enhanced recovery techniques that our microbiology colleagues have access to, but they really need that environmental expertise. And then you've got sort of two other areas of reprocessing personnel and training and turnover, right? As well as the sampling technique itself. If you culture poorly, you're gonna get bad results. And we never wanna collect data without a meaningful data collection plan, but also a data action plan in order to drive what we're gonna do from those results. So from that FTA said, oh my gosh, we have this massive problem. And so they started sort of this trigger of releasing information about what healthcare facilities should start doing. The sort of first was an alarming one of, we have a problem, we've identified the problem, we know what sort of the individual sources of the problem are, but we don't yet have a holistic solution. And so they recommended that facilities certainly revamp their reprocessing efforts, but also to look at devices that were FDA cleared that had some type of disposable component. Um, with the endoscopes as an example, it was likely the distal end caps and the elevators that were actually holding the organism, the CRE that was identified in several hundred outbreaks. Then they came back and said, well, there may be ways for us to reduce transmission if we either make reprocessing more formidable or ideally we get rid of reprocessing. Now think about this in terms of, of the vaccine world and the effectiveness, the overall effectiveness and the strategy associated with polio eradication. Right. That's totally different than what we've seen with COVID, where, yes, the vaccine is going to decrease mortality and morbidity, but it's not going to necessarily stop infection. Right. But with polio, we know that that is a very, very effective vaccine. We're, what we're looking at here is, are we trying to do something that's just going to reduce the risk or can we possibly eliminate it by taking other mechanisms into consideration? So then they found out, oh, my gosh, there's now a problem in the urology space right? Same types of devices, same types of people using the devices. There's one key difference here is that a lot of the urological procedures are done in the outpatient setting. 
So for those of you that might have outpatient urology, this might be a little homework item to take back to your facilities and, and go and observe what they're doing. I remember the very first time I observed a urology scope uh, getting quote unquote reprocessed. And I, I think Dr. Carrico can relate to this story because I know she has something similar, but I, I walked into the office and they, they, they had an issue with what they called scope breakdown where the uh, polyurethane and some of the other things were falling apart. And I said, well, show me your process. And they said, okay, here's the scope. It just came from the patient. I said, well, let me just follow you around. They put it in their break room sink in hot water. They had that water going all day long. They never changed the water. They then pulled it out of there and put high level disinfectant in the sink next to it. So it was a sort of a two sided sink. One had a garbage disposal. And so on the other side, they would keep high level disinfectant uh, in there. There was never any manual brushing. There was never any assessment of the device. There was never any leak testing, right? All of the basic core elements that were required. And then they actually would put it in the dishwasher to rinse it. Right? These are all things that are happening in healthcare facilities that patients never realize. And certainly infection preventionists may not know because they're not exposed to it until it's too late and there's an issue. And then there was a third problem that came up. And this came up, unfortunately, during the height of the pandemic with bronchoscopy. And they found that there were a lot of issues with cross-contamination with bronchoscopy. And if we think about the nature of the procedure of a bronch, right, whether it's done bedside in the ICU or it's done in the bronchoscopy suite, there's still that potential for aerosolization. So not only are we aerosolizing different things during the procedure, but now we've got a device that is retaining organisms and also patient body fluids. And we found that things like the O-rings, which we're all familiar with, are going to harbor organism. The glue comes up. You're going to see issues with different valves, um, as well as some of the channels that are associated with this. And then most recently, just in the last 30 days, there was an urgent uh, FTA safety alert that came out regarding the Carl Storrs urological endoscopes. And this is the one that I was referencing where even if you follow the reprocessing steps as validated by the manufacturer, it's actually failing reprocessing. Um, and so that tells us that we had a fundamental regulatory failure here in assessing for risk of, of following the IFUs, those instructions for use, and ensuring that there was, this device was gonna be safe for patients. Right. And at the end of the day, the patient's expectation is that these devices will be safe. And really, if you were to go survey patients, they would actually assume that these devices are sterile. They don't realize that these devices are high level disinfected. Um, and, and hopefully they, they're at least at that. So uh, the next day, FDA issued another safety alert and talked about the risk associated with duodenoscopes. They continue to see outbreaks. And so they went further in this one and said, not only should you look at reprocessing, but you need to move to sterilization. And if you can't move to sterilization, you should essentially reassess what you're using, right? Now you could certainly move to sterilization with some devices, but keep in mind that sterilization does a couple things. One is it dramatically increases your, your sort of turnaround time. It's gonna increase your costs, but it also reduces the longevity, the, the sort of uh, shelf life, if you will, of those medical devices, because many of them are not designed to withstand sterilization. And if they can undergo some sterilization means, um, then it can be difficult to recover those uh, devices because they'll start to break down, right? And, and it may be very, very expensive. And so the FDA you know, basically said either sterilization or move to a disposable device that eliminates the risk from the equation so that we can be safer for our patients. And, and right behind that came this new AMI standard, which some of you may have seen the ST91. And this one has really created a, a little bit of controversy um, for a couple different reasons, but this is really um, the single largest standard for endoscope safety um, compared to that of the ARN, uh, the perioperative nursing group. They also have some great resources as well, but this one had been long awaited and it really looks at best practices for reprocessing. What you'll find in here though, is that it's a little bit contradictory in terms of what the FDA has said. So the FDA has really sort of advised to go down a path of um, single use, if, if, if at all possible, um, whereas Amy really talks more about moving towards sterilization. Uh, and so you'll see some discrepancies associated with that. Now, part of that standard breaks down a couple of important elements, you know, things like how do we assess the device? How do we make sure that it's going to be 
um, properly maintained? What do we do from a quality control standpoint? Um, are there ways that we could design our reprocessing suites to be a little bit safer, right? All of those types of things are important elements of any infection control program and also to reduce the risk of incident uh, with using some of these reusable medical devices. Now, not in the, the actual uh, AMI standard, if you will, they don't talk about rigid scopes because that's a whole different area. They don't talk about TE scopes. They don't talk about steam steriliz uh, sterilizers. And then certainly anything that's designed for one, uh, one single use um, is not going to be covered here because that's outside of the scope of that standard. What's interesting is that they in, in sort of include this new definition of a high-risk endoscope. Now, let's think about this in terms of the device versus a high-risk patient. So let's say that uh, Dave is a patient in our ICU and he has multiple comorbidities. He's also colonized with a multidrug resistant organism. But let's say that the device that we're using on him is not one that's here on this list, right? It, it could get a little bit wonky to try to interpret whether or not it is still a high risk device, if you will, because they really do it based on the device versus based on the patient. Now, certainly if you're using certain devices in, in different anatomy, um, you know, if I'm going and doing an ERCP as an example, I'm moving into more of a sterile body area where there's going to be that broader risk for contamination where I'm dragging that organism from the, the actual, um, you know, non-sterile area into the sterile area. Um, that's going to pose a risk here. So I, I've got a little bit of mixed emotions about this definition that they propose, but certainly it does bring to light that all of these devices, right, especially those that are not uh, single use can be high risk devices. So as far as cleaning methods, right, those are determined not, I repeat, not by the FDA. People are always surprised by that. The FDA doesn't tell a manufacturer how to clean the device. It's up to the manufacturer to not only decide, validate, and prove, right, that their method works. So if we go back to that Carl Storrs example, let's talk about the elephant in the room. How did we have a validated reprocessing uh, process that was submitted by the FDA, reviewed by the FDA, approved, and then put on the label that is failing, right? That means that the entire process from start to finish failed. Um, so we've got to think about how we can make the instructions for use either simpler or make them go away. There's also sort of those overall um, steps for cleaning and the disinfection and how do we store the equipment? For example, if you walk into a, uh, a GI suite, for example, and they have a storage cabinet and you can see diapers at the bottom of that storage cabinet with dripping water coming down from hopes that automatically tells you right there that we have an issue because those devices should not be enough that they're draining onto a diaper, onto a floor, into a cabinet, which is then creating humidity, which is going to create organism, right? That's a perfect setup for a fungal pathogen. So we want to ensure that we're not only following the instructions for use, but we're also setting up our environment to win so that it's going to reduce the risk for cross-contamination. So reprocessing itself can mean different things to different people. But part of this is to render the device as safe as possible for the next patient's use. Now that may be sterilization where we're removing all microbial life. It may be high level disinfection, right? Or it may be reprocessing of like a blood pressure cuff where we use a low or intermediate level disinfectant. Um, but all of these are gonna be based on human interaction. Now, there are some machines that are doing things like automatic drying, but I'll tell you another risk is that a lot of people are drying medical instruments with alcohol, right? They're trying to speed up the drying process, and so therefore they flush the instrument with isopropyl alcohol. Well, in theory, does that help dry? Absolutely it does, but alcohol is a known fixative. And so as a fixative, it then takes the organisms that are already present on there, and it essentially super glues them to the device. That's a great setup for a potential biofilm, which we know uh, is not going to be a good thing. One of the other fascinating things is a boroscope. And I'm sure Dave probably has a boroscope at his desk because he has everything, right? But a boroscope is essentially a smaller scope that goes inside of it. So think about it if you've ever caught a plumber and they bring that snake and they snake your toilet to see what type of issues going on with your pipes. It's the same philosophy. Um, what's interesting though, is that it's equivalent to taking somebody who has never ever had an anatomy class and expecting them to be able to read and interpret a chest X-ray. Right, So they're looking at the, the chest film and they're trying to understand the anatomical landmarks. And then they're trying to add on to that any pathophysiology of disease. 
So not only do they not know where the lungs are, but they don't realize what tuberculosis or what pneumonia um, may look like. And so we've got to be very careful about setting expectations where if we give somebody a tool to go inside a device and assess it, how do I know how to interpret that image? And even the manufacturers don't know how to interpret the image. And so this makes it a, a fun tool, but I'm not really sure of the utility of it because I don't know how to, in a standardized fashion, tell people to interpret that image. And if, for example, if you go through the device and you see that there's a gouge in a channel, well, is that safe enough to continue to use? Or should you take it out of service and return it to the manufacturer? Or does the manufacturer need to replace the device? Right. And so my rule of thumb has always been if I see damage, I want that area of the device replaced so that the damage is taken away. Because we know especially gouges can lead to tears. Tears can then lead to flooding of the device. You can have issues with glues that are then going to allow organisms to settle in under O-rings. Right. So these boroscopes can be helpful in identifying sort of gross contaminants, but they're not very helpful in determining what you need to do. So from that, we've talked in, in sort of grand rounds past a little bit about the hierarchy of controls. And in terms of evaluating levels of risk, right, there's sort of different levels that we can take. At the very bottom where PPE is, that is your actually least effective means of intervening. At the very top where elimination is, that's your most effective. So going back to our example of the polio vaccine, if we can get the polio vaccine, you know, we can distribute it across the world and we can get good compliance with it, then we can hopefully eliminate polio from the face of the earth. Love to say the same thing about COVID. Um, but if we use PPE, right, we know that that's sort of at the very bottom of this upside down triangle and is only one way to protect the healthcare workforce. But if you don't use it correctly, it doesn't work. Um, if we put up engineering controls that don't make sense, then we reduce our workflow and we're, we're sort of hurt, hurting our optimization there. Um, we can look at means like substitution where we actually replace the hazard altogether. But our goal is to really use a combination of these, but to get to the highest level of risk reduction possible. And so that's really where we get into this sort of battle between, well, should I continue to use reusable medical devices or should I look at something that's sterile and disposable? Well, if you look on sort of the traditional pathway, right, of reusable devices, you've got to maintain them, there's wear and tear, there's maintenance plans, you may have to send these out, get loaner devices, certainly you can't always assess for reprocessing uh, failure, this is not like where you have a load of instruments that goes through sterilization, and we get a biological indicator that tells us that the load was, was sterilized, right, we don't have that capability. Now we do have culturing, we've got things like ATP, we've got products like channel check that look for protein, but none of those are foolproof, right? And again, our patient's expectation is that we're giving them a safe uh, procedure, especially for those that are coming in that are elective. Imagine you go in, Dave, and you go in for your elective colonoscopy and they call you three days later and say, oh, by the way, we're so sorry, but we think that that device was never disinfected and we need you to come in for the next six months for testing for HIV and hepatitis, right? He, he's going to probably not get a colonoscopy again um, because we've now scared and alienated that patient from a preventative elective important procedure by not doing our job to protect the device, which then protects the patient. On the disposable it's sterile side, obviously you throw it away. So there's no need there. Now, people always ask about sort of landfill waste. I, I think from what I've read with the FDA's devices, um, most of those devices are now becoming um, either biodegradable or they do have some capability for recycling, but I don't have to worry about reprocessing. So there's no human variability in there. And the device will always perform the same as it comes out of the box for the practitioner that's going to be using them. And so we've got this choice, right? Do we go down the same pathway we've always gone down, which we all know is the definition of insanity, or do we go down pathway in door B and say, let's do something different that's gonna not only protect the patient, but also ensure that our care is gonna be consistent each and every time, which is really the, the basis for evidence-based practice. And it's always back to that pendulum, right? That risk versus benefit equation. Are our benefits outweighing the risk or are our risk outweighing the benefits? And we certainly want to make sure the benefits are outweighing the risk associated with this. Now, can we eliminate every single risk in healthcare? Absolutely not. We can walk outside our door today and get hit by a car. Um, we can also have the same problem in healthcare where we have a contaminated medical device. And so that is certainly something that we need to be aware of.
Um, but there are differences amongst the devices that are making it a little bit more affordable. Um, three or four years ago, you would see that these were very cost prohibitive. Now, as the market is moving to them, I think it's driving down the cost uh, for sure. And then lastly, uh, this is actually directly from the FDA's wish list. So I happened to be on an FDA working group for reusable medical devices, and they said, we need to come up with sort of a cheat sheet to direct the industry about what we're looking for, right? We want smoother surfaces. We want to be able to disassemble it and actually see it. We want to be able to actually go inside the device and actually know if there's a risk there. Can we have disposable components or elimination of components, right? Can we see how fluids are, are present there? And this is a really important thing because it helps to drive what innovation is with the manufacturers, right? Because we don't develop healthcare products, we just use them. But it, it is really us that directs the manufacturers on what we're looking for. And so this was really the first time I can think of in my career where not only did FDA say, we want you to do this, but they gave them a list of, hey, here's the characteristics that we're looking for in future safer medical devices um, from that perspective. And so, you know, as a patient ourselves, right, we're all patients. I don't want somebody to just reduce something. I don't want them to reduce the risk. I want them to totally eliminate it if possible. Um, and so our strategy here is risk reduction at all, at all costs, right? To prevent that infection, that contamination from ever taking place, especially in our patients that are already sick um, and within our inpatient environment. And so if we can, let's get to total infection mitigation. Let's eliminate the risk from the equation. But you first got to figure out where you are in your institution as far as your overall risk profile. What devices are you using? How many um, procedures do you do in a year? Sort of observing the reprocessing process. What validation do you have that it's actually working, right? And if it doesn't look right, it's probably not. Right? And we should never be afraid to speak up and say something about that. And I always go back to what I call the three Ps, people, process, product in that order with good, empowered, well-trained healthcare workers at the front line, followed by reliable processes that are validated and rooted in evidence-based practice and supported by good products right, that are FDA cleared and meet the needs of the clinical environment we will win this fight against contamination of medical devices. But it does take us sort of getting on a journey together in order to be able to do that. So with that, I'll stop and see uh, what questions. And I see Cheryl already has a question um, as well. And for those of you that didn't see it, Cheryl's question is, what's the cost of a reusable device versus a disposable sterile device? So as I understand it now, with most of the categories, they are fairly comparable if you add all of the cost of reprocessing. So what a lot of people have done is they said, well, you know, I'm going to have this reusable device and those range from anywhere from 30 to uh, $70,000, right? So they sort of amateurized that and said, okay, based on the number of procedures we do a year, this is a lot cheaper. But what they failed to count into that was the labor cost, right, of the reprocessing personnel, um, certainly the overhead of the AERs, those automated uh, reprocessing machines, all of the HLD chemicals, all of the brushes, all of the stuff that's needed in order to do that, adding to that the dryers, um, the scope uh, cabinets, all of those types of things. If you're using a reusable device, you don't have to do any of that. You don't even need storage. All you need is a storage room. It doesn't even have to be a clean utility room because they're all stored in sterile packaging. So it can be stored on shelves for that matter. So um, as I understand it now, most of the costs are fairly comparable. And I know a couple of the manufacturers have got cost calculators that you can go out and download um, to. So hopefully that answers your question, Cheryl. And Dave, sorry for picking on you for always being the patient, but you just happened to be, for, Ruth went off camera, so I didn't have her to, to, to use. That's my job. Yeah. So Hudson, I've, I've got a, a, a comment and question. Yeah, sure. As you went through, you talked about the, you know, the risks that we have when we have uh, process variability. Yep. Um, and even under the best of circumstances, when we feel like we've got, you know, we've got a stable process, we still can have then, you know, some unexpected outcomes. But when we look at the, the big picture of all of the medical devices that we are using that need to be reprocessed, what do you think is an approach so that we can prevent what, what I'm seeing of as happening? And I'm on the, the, the um, Amy uh, task force that's looking at reprocessing of the uh, ultrasound probes. Mm -hmm that we will have then different types of devices. And we, we have then the expectation that someone who is 
um, has a lot of expertise that feels like they can do something differently and they can still get the, the same results. How, how should we be looking at this as a total program? Because not only do we have that process variability, but you also mentioned we will have these devices in the hospital, in long-term care facilities, in outpatient settings. And my sense is that you know people are getting back to some of their preventive care because I think we had talked, it's it's very difficult now to get a get an appointment with your gastroenterologist. If it's if you missed your colonoscopy during you know the past two years of the pandemic everybody's going to get their preventive care. So, you know, that means a lot of people, you know, a lot of turnover and, you know, we have to have things uh, done very quickly. How do we look at this as a, as a reprocessing medical device program? So I think first and foremost, it, it has to be a program, right? So many people, many facilities treat it by department. And so they essentially say, here's the GI plan. Here's the bronchoscopy plan. Here's the ENT plan. Here's the urology plan. And to your point, we have to bring it back to here's the health systems plan, right? For reprocessing any of these reusable medical devices. And I think, you know, first and foremost is to get an idea of where you are today. You know, what is your current process? Go out and physically observe what's taking place do photos, do remediation, bring the manufacturers in to observe that because they're really the experts. You know, an IP especially is not reprocessing devices. Um, and so unless you have that expertise and you do that routinely, you don't have the necessary skill set to go out and assess for risk. Now, can you look at other generic things? Absolutely. But you want to have somebody standing by your side that is an expert in that specific process to, to be that. But I think the fundamental question, though, to your, your original point is, do I want to do any of this, right? Do I want to be doing any of these things with reprocessing and validation and culturing? While those are all very formidable steps, I do have an option now to not do any of those, which is to go to a single use sterile disposable device. That was not an option three years ago. And, and I have to give the FDA kudos for this because they were pretty forceful and said, manufacturers, you're not doing enough. We need better solutions and we need them right now. And we will work with you to expedite the approvals, which they did. Um, and so to me, if I have a choice between picking elimination and not worrying about it, right, not staying up at night seeing, well, did Dave reprocess that device? Oh, no, I don't know if he did or not having confidence in my process versus going to a process that's 100% reliable and repeatable every single time. I'm going to pick that second option every day of the week. Um, because from an infection prevention standpoint, you only have so many intention units. And so you can only go after so many projects. And if I can get rid of a major project where we know that there is universally risk to the patient because of these devices failing um, and reprocessing failing, it, it just seems like a no brainer uh, to entertain that second option. Or having a framework like Spalding, you know, that we can fall back on that kind of is our guide for helping us make decisions. So. Yeah. And I think Cheryl had another question. Do I uh, do at GI docs outpatient endoscopy centers have to publicize if they use reusable or disposable devices? Uh, the answer is no. So they, they don't have to do that. And I think more importantly, depending upon who you are, there is different public reporting requirements from FDA. Um, so, for example, not every healthcare provider is required to report, um, depending upon the type of medical device. Um, healthcare facilities a lot of times do not report. And, and what I would say is that we have an underestimation of outbreaks and contamination, particularly in the outpatient setting, because we absolutely know that those folks do not report these. They don't call the FDA, they don't call the manufacturer, they don't call public health. They simply just treat the infection and never think about the device as the source um, of that infection. And we've seen this over and over again, um, especially in the urology space and the pulmonology space. Uh, and so it, it is definitely a problem. I, as a patient, though, I'll tell you this, um, I, I would ask the question. I would certainly say, what devices do you use um, in order to, to, to sort of uh, do the procedure? And, and it will start to change the tide with the way providers think. Um, I remember I, I met the chief of GI um, for UCLA. Um, and for context, UCLA was probably one of the biggest outbreaks associated with duodenoscopes in the whole country, um, to the point where they had people that had PTSD, their staff had PTSD because of the news media and the picketing and the, the protest and stuff. Um, and they had a lot of patients that died. And I remember something that he said that stood out to me. And I think Dr. Ramirez can appreciate this as a, a division chair is he said, the most important person to me at orientation was the reprocessing personnel. He said, I made it a point as the chief of my department 
to always on the very first day, the very first hour of orientation for reprocessing personnel to go and physically meet them, to shake their hand, to tell them thank you, to let them know that because of them and their work that my job was possible as the physician. Um, And and I thought that was such a, a great reminder of the value of interprofessional collaboration and realizing that regardless of title or discipline or function, every single person on the healthcare team matters and they matter equally. And a physician can't do their job with a medical device if that device is not safe. Um, And so it's a reminder of the fact that there will always be people involved, but to the point where we can get people out of the unreliable aspects of this process, it's gonna make the world a safer place. It's gonna make our patients have greater trust in us. It also improves throughput because I'm not waiting for those devices to be reprocessed. You know, facilities can only afford to buy so many different devices. Um, and so if you can only afford to buy six uh, colonoscopy um, or uh, colonoscopes, excuse me, for colonoscopies, well, what happens when you have 10 patients, right? Those patients are then waiting, that physician is then waiting. So you can actually improve throughput by using disposable sterile solutions and improve your efficiency and redeploy those reprocessing personnel to more bedside tech positions. So if there is an outbreak, then it is the responsibility of the facility to not only report that outbreak, that is our state law. Um, But as part of your investigation, if you identify a device that may be associated with that outbreak, you must also include that in your report. And then what does that IP do or what does that facility do in the event they have a device and they have a question about whether or not that device is implicated in the outbreak? Correct. And, and that's, that's exactly what happened with this particular case in Boston that I was referencing. There was, there was actually an internal debate between the facility's infection preventionist, their risk management, and their legal department. Um, and they all wanted to do three different things. The IP did not know what to do. The risk management said, I, I need to do something to stop the risk. But the, the attorney said, we don't want to do anything and send the device out. Right. And so you've got to get everybody on the same page to your point, Ruth, ahead of time as part of that outbreak response program. And this is a great this is why I love seeing so many people from Dr. Spicer's team and the public health group on these calls, because they're your advocates. They're your allies to help you navigate this process and to make those official requests through CDC if needed. Um, because CDC really saved my butt on that particular incident by performing that laboratory analysis and helping us identify where the organism was coming from. And then we were able to translate that back into learning for the facility to let them know how to not let that, you know, happen again. Um, But, you know, you're right, you got to have somebody that's engaged up front in that process. And the most important thing you could do 100% is to take the device out of service and quarantine it. That is what people forget to do, or they, or they'll say it's sitting on my desk. No, it needs to be quarantined. And when I say quarantine, it needs to be sealed in a bio bag and it needs to be locked away with only one person with a key so that no one else can get access to it. Because I have seen with my own eyes, quarantine devices get back in service. So make sure you have sort of a lockout tag out um, process associated with that. And 100% make your your second phone call to be public health. Mm -hmm. And you do not send that device then back to the manufacturer. You, so, you may, yeah, it depends on, it depends. So if it, it really what normal manufacturers that are really ethical will do is they will collaborate directly with the facility and public health. And they'll ask, what would you like us to do? Because remember the manufacturer has the expertise to tear down the device, public health does not. Um, so as far as organism recovery, Normally, the process would be that, you know, either you would send it to an environmental lab or CDC or the state, and then they would then send that to the manufacturer for the mechanical analysis um, of this. So in this particular incidence that I referenced, I had the scope overnighted to CDC. CDC then did the recovery. We let them throw it out. They kept the device until that was finished. And then we did a teardown of the device and looked at every mechanical failure and wrote up a uh, a risk analysis. And that was shared with FDA. It was also shared with other people in the in the community, um, because this is not something where FDA can say this is proprietary. We have to share these learnings with the entire healthcare community. Well, I know this is a bit, has been a big topic to, uh, to cover in, in our short period of time. I, I think this is certainly going to be something that we're going to continue to look at because this impacts every uh, setting where healthcare is delivered. So thank you uh, very much for this presentation. So Dr. Ramirez, um, would you uh, like to close us out for today? Yes, no, I agree with you, Ruth. I mean, uh, uh, had some touch in uh, several topics that probably we need to go into more uh, detail. Um, When you mentioned ATP and other ways to look at uh, 
how to uh, not contamination medical devices. So there are so many questions related to this topic. But again, we're going to circle back to, to more detail to this topic of, of environmental uh, problems that we have, uh, the, the idea of the environmental laboratory, the idea of the environmental antibiogram, environmental antimicrobial stewardship. The, the, the environment is becoming a big issue for us uh, in, in all this topic of infection control and, and prevention and antimicrobial stewardship. Uh, Hudson, again, uh, thank you very much. Great presentation. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, all of you, for your uh, attendance.